You're listening to the Cycling Podcast, brought to you by iWoka. Flexible loans built for small businesses. iwoca.co.uk Well, Merry Christmas, Daniel. Merry Christmas, Richard. Merry Christmas, Lionel. Ho, 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 Richard. That's, that's good. Um, who would actually, be, who we're going to play... Out- who would be playing Scrooge if we did a oh. if we, well this is a Christmas well, special isn't it? Who do you think? Well, I would say Napalm. I'm I'm yeah. I love Christmas. I'm very Christmassy. I'm I'm Scrooge like the other 51 weeks of the year, but at Christmas I go completely the other way. Do you? I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do like <laughs> Not Christmas. For a second. I do I I enjoy the the the, the nice wind down into Christmas and all the food and everything as you'd expect. Um, yeah, I like I like Christmas. Do you like Christmas pudding? I do like Christmas pudding, yeah, but I prefer Christmas cake. Oh, really? Mm. Interesting. Uh, how about you? Well, how we, about you? Uh, I mean, will you? My, my first my first Christmas in France, and we're um, uh, struggling to get some of the things that we really enjoy at Christmas, like Christmas crackers, for example. Can't get Christmas crackers over here. Are you Richard? Because your wife has Polish heritage do you do a traditional polish christmas eve dinner um, like my family does well we do a christmas eve dinner yeah rather than christmas day but, no, uh, but that's a that's a french thing as well isn't it no beetroot soup um no beetroot soup no no um no uh, other than that quite traditional but yeah christmas pudding and uh, we've we've had sent from the uk uh brandy butter and uh yeah, getting Christmas crackers delivered by Lizzie Banks on Sunday. She's passing this way uh, on her way to Girona. <laughs> so she's going to come and stay Sunday night and maybe go for a bike ride on Monday in this area. So that's very kind. She's bringing cheddar cheese and Christmas crackers. What have you asked for? What are you getting for Christmas, Lionel? Well, I've already had my gift from Simon the photographer one of his fantastic jigsaw puzzles which he dropped off the other day and I've uh, cleared the dining room table to start putting it together a 1000 piece jigsaw puzzle uh, which when completed will show Geraint Thomas and Chris Froome climbing out out Duez one of Simon's well I've heard, finest I've, I've photos heard that Chris a Froome ago. yeah I've heard that Chris Froome has got that jigsaw and he's but he's put it together with emitting Garrett Thomas from the picture. Yeah, for Chris Froome, uh, it's a 440-piece jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> and Daniel, what are you What are you getting for Christmas? Uh, a vaccine. No, actually, vaccine is my, my, <laughs> my present to my girlfriend. Um, I'm getting a <laughs> heart rate monitor, hopefully. I haven't I haven't used a heart rate monitor for many years, but I've, and I, I, I'm kind of against the whole... I'm against equipment, generally, for... Um, <laughs> for running cycling but particularly running in my case um but i've succumbed you know usually i like to i like to run bare chested um why do i want to know my heart rate um i think i'd um i i I don't know well i had the same problem always in cycling i'm very one paced i find it difficult to go any faster than i currently go and i find it difficult to go any slower than i currently go and i feel that heart rate based training will help me to regulate my speed a bit better rich wow any coaches out there want to take on daniel uh please get in touch contact at the cycling podcast.com um well while we're talking about christmas presents a couple of quick minutes before we get into the news roundup and in uh, in today's episode we are going to be looking back on our moments of the year and in the final part will be my christmas quiz which is not a patch on rose manley's christmas quiz in the cycling podcast feminine it's very entertaining this one, uh, well, I've done my best, um, but I've got some questions for Daniel and Lionel. Um, before we go on, though, I'm, I, I on the turbo train the other day, I watched The Racer, a new film about, uh, well, set in Ireland in 98 and the start of the Tour de France. Um, now, adapting uh, cycling stories for the big screen, and this will be in cinemas, apparently, from the 18th of December, which is in a couple of days. It's also on all the usual platforms uh, you'll be able to watch it from the 18th of december but I, I quite enjoyed it did you watch it daniel um no richard i've seen the trailer um haven't yet seen the full movie yet it's challenging to depict bike racing and especially the tour de france on the screen but they've done an all right job 
Yeah, I think uh, cycling fans will quite enjoy it. Yeah, sporting adaptations of sporting events. Sports always difficult, isn't it? And movies. I always find that American American movies adapting or showing American sports do a better job of it. But that's maybe because you know I don't have the the learned eye, um, and I, which would enable me to see the sort of inconsistencies and see you know the ways in which it's hammed up but maybe american listeners can tell me for for example things like i don't know um, any given sunday seem quite realistic to me um even you know the scenes in friday night lights high school football mm. you know they yeah. seem, seem to be very well done to me but i'm not sure about yeah. european films the the bike rate bike racing is hard i'd say this one's better than the program in terms of how it depicts cycling i mean some of it's ridiculous obviously uh, but the the main actor who plays a rider um is qu- is a cyclist himself and reasonably convincing if a little bit too large to be a tour de france how rider. does it measure up to um i get them mixed up what the, the two american cycling films from the 80s one with kevin costner and jennifer gray um, Bla- um american flyers american flyers and, yep. and what's the other one breaking away breaking, breaking away. away which one's which which one is breaking the one is about the italian yes. uh, kid isn't it Yes, that's often been it's often been leveled at me that um, I had it. Well, hang on, it's your story, that. isn't it? Yes, yes. Well, it's well worth a watch. The racer. I also mentioned the new Rafa book, the Racing Secrets of Rafael Gemignani, um, who is a, a legendary figure. He was a rider himself, and then it looked after Jacques Oncatil. He's still alive. Um, He's around Clermont-Ferrand, isn't he? Because we talked about him when we were there at the Tour de France. And, and it's a beautiful little book by Isabel Best um, that's just been published. And another Christmas gift idea is, of course, Friend of the Podcast subscription, uh, which you can buy as a gift. How do you do that, Lionel? Well, you go to thecyclingpodcast.com slash friends. And then uh, just at the top of the page, there's uh, a, a, a list of the sort of frequently asked questions about how the whole system works or you can just go straight to join and uh, there's an option to give a subscription as a gift as well so if you want to um, sign somebody else up if maybe if you're already a friend of the podcast and you think somebody else would enjoy access to the friends of the podcast episodes you can give the gift of a subscription for a year the gift of friendship what more could you ask for at christmas um, do you have a news roundup for us, please, Lionel? I do a few brief uh, items of news to cover this week. Uh, first of all, the UCI has been busy announcing a range of safety measures, one of which is something we talked about on the Cycling Podcast in light of the crash at the Tour of Poland, which was standardising and improving the uh, the barriers on the side of the road. Um, they The UCI are uh, introducing some improved safety measures there, and they've also unveiled a concussion protocol now this is quite a long document you can read it on the uci's website uh, if you wish to find out more about it and i think in the new year we'll ask ian boswell what his thoughts are on this but in brief um, the idea is that non-health professionals working within the the peloton will be trained to recognize the signs of concussion um, because obviously the first people on the scene of a crash are usually the mechanics sports directors and other riders so if they are all um, familiar with the telltale signs of concussion uh, they may be able to help intervene and uh, you know save a rider from the, the instinct of just pushing on um with with potentially a head injury uh there's some other measures about uh, what length of time riders would have to sit out if they are diagnosed with concussion uh, complete rest for between 24 and 48 hours and not returning to competition for at least a week after their symptoms have cleared up which obviously has pretty dramatic um implications in stage racing so um that's a, a a really kind of hot topic in a lot of sports at the moment and the uci is addressing that but it would be good to tackle that in the new year and, and find out what uh, some of the riders think about that uh, tom pidcock won his biggest cyclocross event so far of his career a super prestige race in Havera. A uh, solo win well ahead of Matthew van der Poel and Toon Ertz. Uh, it was his first elite cyclocross win. And, uh, well, he's joining Ineos on the road after the end of the cyclocross season in the spring, isn't he? Um, the UAE Team Emirates rider Diego Ulissi, who won two stages of the Giro, 
earlier on this year has been diagnosed with a heart condition myocarditis and could be out for several months while he um, is monitored and uh, it's, it's deemed that it's safe for him to continue racing. Uh, Ricardo Rico has been handed a lifetime ban. Now, Daniel, he was due to return to racing at some point in the, well, quite distant future. I think he's 2024. 2024, wasn't it? Um, but the ban has been extended to a lifetime ban. So any thoughts of a comeback of any kind uh, dashed. I don't think there was a, was there a serious, there was some talk of Rico coming back, wasn't there? He, he had said that he would try to come back. Well, uh, no, there'll be no comeback to cycling, but of course he's, career as a gelataio an ice cream maker has been thriving the last it's few years unaff- it's unaffected um, by this he is it? <laughs> opened yeah he opened a new uh, gelateria in um vignola just outside modena where he's from recently choco loco i think it's called and um by all accounts they do a very fine well a very fine vanilla apparently interesting um, i'd be very I'm, wary I'm, of i've been reading very, the I'd be, reviews i'd be very I'd be very, very wary of some of the, the dark the dark red chocolates in his range of ice creams. The dark the dark red ice creams were rather in his range. We should, Napalm, point out that um so Ricardo Rico was well, he was infamous for uh doping scandal that erupted at the two thousand eight Tour de France when he actually tested positive. And then subsequently there was the story about um him attempting a bit of a DIY blood transfusion and that led to a second ban. Um, This latest offence, or what's triggered the lifetime ban, is a a pretty murky affair involving him trying to buy drugs, I believe, in 2015. There was also a a former, um, I think it was a Napoli footballer, um, who has also been sanctioned for the same same affair um which was well which occurred in tuscany i believe um there was the esports world championships the first ever edition 50 kilometer races held on zwift and the women's race was won by ashley moorman passio ahead of sarah giganti and the men's race was won by a 26 year old professional rower a German called Jason Osborne, uh, who, when asked by worldrowing.com who his favourite other sports person was, said Primoz Roglic. And uh, what well, Osborne has raced on the road as well, he was sixth in the 2019 German Time Trial Championships, just a minute and 27 slower than Tony Martins. And finally, another team name change to get to grips with next year Bahrain, who, of course, are no longer going to be linked with the McLaren supercar company, uh, are going to be called Bahrain Victorious, um, which strikes me as a little presumptuous. Um, two World Tour wins for their name in 2020. Uh, maybe they should just be Bahrain until they actually get a win on the board. I don't know. You're listening to The Cycling Podcast, brought to you by iWaka. Flexible loans built for small businesses. Join 50,000 customers taking on life's twists and turns and scaling new heights with iWalker. If you run a business, find out more at iwalker.co.uk. I W O C A.co.uk. Thanks very much to iWalker, our title sponsor, who have partnered with Mental Health UK to develop a model offering support for small businesses, ranging from practical tools available to everyone through to personal attention for individuals where needed. If you run a small business and you're interested in this, there's a survey that you can fill in and find at iwaka.co.uk. That will help them understand the issues that their customers face. As Iwaka say, the pandemic has forced small businesses to endure even more challenges than in normal times. And this has shone a light on the mental health of the small business owners in particular and their resilience in weathering the impacts on their businesses and employees. For more information on the partnership with Mental Health UK and everything else that iWaka can do for small businesses, go to iwaka.co.uk. That's I-W-O-C-A dot co dot U-K. Well, each of us is going to pick a moment from the year. This is our way of, I suppose, reviewing the year, the season, um, and uh, doing so through a, a moment that each of us each of us picks. Um, you go first, Daniel. What's your moment of the year? Well, Rich, I think it's probably the image of most people's cycling season this year, and that is the image, not so much of Primoz Roglic crossing the line at La Planche de Belfi um, on the penultimate stage of the Tour de France, but of his teammates, particularly Tom Dumoulin and Wout van Aert, um, watching the disaster unfold for Roglic and Jumbo Visma. I think, you know, the view I had of it, 
um, was pretty similar to what people saw on TV because I was standing in the mix zone just behind the finish line, which was actually where Dumoulin and Van Aert were watching. And and they'd been there for 20 minutes or so. And, you know, their expression had become progressively you know, more concerned as time had passed. I remember interviewing Sepp Kuss. He'd finished his time trial. And, um, and, and, and the interview I did with him was kind of similar to the ones I'd done with other Jumbo Visma riders when they'd finished their time trial. They were quite sort of blasé, matter-of-fact, really, about Primoz Roglic's chances of, of holding on, as we all expected him to do. Um, and But as I was talking to Sepp Kuss, I remember there were... There were updates coming through and there were time gaps um coming through and um, it was looking slightly dicey for Roglic and I remember saying to Sepp that oh it wasn't going too well but even then you know it, it seemed almost um inconceivable that that what what came to pass would come to pass but you know it's a moment that I think will really well define this year's cycling season and it's one it will become one of the most famous images in in Tour de France history, particularly that sort of shot of, of Van Aert mm. and, and Dumoulin. It's funny that I, I was going to go for that that day as well, but that is the most obvious image: the Van Aert Dumoulin, you know, hands cro- arms crossed in front of them, and uh, Van Aert was wearing a face mask, wasn't he? And Dumoulin wasn't, and it, it was a look of sort of horror uh, just on their faces, but. It was a day that threw it, threw up so many images, actually. I mean, from uh, Pogacar warming up in this very kind of casual fashion with his headphones on and his cap on and, and looking incredibly relaxed. That was quite striking, even at the time. Um, and then Roglic himself uh, looking increasingly ragged on the climb. Uh, you know, and, and that, that smoothness that we've come to expect, that fluidity of, of Roglic just, just kind of going and the helmet, you know, at, at an angle, and the the he was almost unraveling before our eyes. You know, and it's all relative. And there was this debate afterwards about whether Roglic had actually cracked or not, given that he was, I think, fourth on the stage, wasn't he? Um, but in relative terms, he did crack. You know, and uh, Pogacar put in an extraordinary performance to 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 win ahead of guys like Demula as well. Let's not forget. Um, but it was a day that just threw up so many iconic sort of images that 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 will <clears throat> come to define this season and that tour. I think you say there, Rich, that he did crack, but I think you know one of the legacies of that day is is that question um, of whether it was a, a genuine choke, um, and I think that's mm. something that will be debated through the ages. Um, I mean. I think pretty much immediately afterwards, people pointed out that, well, actually, the, the result hadn't been that catastrophic for Roglic in the sense that he finished the time trial one minute 56 behind Pogacar. His cushion, his advantage um, at the start of the day had been 57 seconds. So, you know, he, he obviously conceded a lot of time, um, almost three minutes to Pogacar, which sounds bad, but fifth on the stage. Um, but, you know... <laughs> You think of the great chokes um, in sporting history. I think the one for British audiences that always comes to mind is Jana Novotna in the 93 um, Wimbledon final where she was 4-1 up on Steffi Graf and a, a one or two breaks up in the final set and then um, started double faulting, started missing volleys and um, was famous as well for the aftermath of that match because she was sort of consoled by, it was Princess, was it Princess? Help me out here, chaps. Royal family, the blonde lady. Princess Michael. Not Princess um, Anne. Princess Prin- Michael of Kent. Princess Michael of Kent. Yes. Um, but a, a, quite, a, quite an iconic image. A lot of people actually forget that Jan Novotna won Wimbledon, um, I think, five years after that. She returned and she sort of exercised that ghost, conquered her demons. Um, another one um, in the 1996 US Masters golf tournament where Greg Norman led by six shots going into the final day and was overhauled spectacularly by Nick Fowler completely fell apart but I mean we ca- can you ever really talk about choking in professional cycling I mean I always I always associate choking more with um events or disciplined sports where the the emphasis is really on the fine motor skills um I always think that in sports like cycling 
And because it's to do with motion, and it's to do with kind of the big muscle groups, um, that, that, that sort of helps to counteract the nervousness and the tension when you're sort of moving, when all it is is sort of, uh, well, uh, in, in, in the case of professional cycling, pushing as hard as possible on the on the pedals. I always wonder whether you can really talk about choking, whether it is a thing, although there's no doubt that um, muscle tension can manifest itself. But yeah, and, and that's and, almost and, to... That's almost to um, to regard the, the riders as robots and not and to discount the, the mental aspect. And I think as soon as you've got, you throw the mental aspect into the mix, then you've got, you know, whether, whether it's a slightly different form of choking or not, I think it, 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 how would it manifest itself? It, it's almost a sense of panic. I mean, uh, if Roglic was, was aware that he was losing time and, and he just began to think, and it can be just the act of thinking. Uh, well, that, well can, that is, can, I mean... In re- in research about choking, I mean that that is essentially what it boils down to. It's usually a, certain, a level of self consciousness, yes, um, about things which previously would have come automatically. I think that's the great contradiction about this day. On the one hand, Roglic, if you told him in the morning you'll finish thirty five seconds behind Tom de Moulin on this stage, you, what would the odds of winning the Tour de France have been? They would have been pretty well stacked in his favour. The, the extraordinary thing was Pogacar's performance. I mean, it was an absolute rout. He didn't just rout Roglic, he routed de Moulin, 121 ahead of de Moulin. Um, and, and, you know, Richie Port as well, no slouching uh, time trials, uh, despite, you know, some of my erroneous commentary during the Tour de France in the lead up um, to that time trial on La Porte oh, yeah. de Belfort. Oh, I, I, I missed that. Just thought, thanks, I missed thanks that. for reminding just, us of I, that. I looked that up. Just thought I'd uh, chuck that in there. Yeah, we, uh-huh. we, we occasionally get things wrong, <laughs> don't we? Um, well, it was kind of, yeah, it was kind of, in, it, it felt with all the drama of that, that of that stage, we kind of maybe didn't pay enough attention to, to your uh, very poor predicting game, Lionel, going into it regarding Lopez and Port. Yeah, well, quite. So we should, let's not focus let's revisit, on that. I mean, let's spend the next 10 minutes talking about that. Very much a secondary <laughs> storyline, though, that. Um, so we don't need to... Uh, there's probably time for me to go and get that edited out of all of the last week of the Tour de France <laughs> episodes. But the, the, when, Daniel, you were listing sort of great moments, great collapses in British sporting history, uh, you can't really... Um, complete that list without Devon Locke, the Queen Mother's racehorse that uh, fell in the final uh, straight of the Grand National in 1956. And, you know, that's that's a kind of sporting <laughs> collapse. I mean, wow. um, that is the kind of iconic sporting collapse, you know, victory in the bag, um, only for... What happened there? Did the horse overthink yeah. it? <laughs> did, did, what, what, did the, what did the horse say afterwards I think, about I think it? The, the horse did start overthinking it. Um, that, but the, the point about Roglic and uh, Pogacar on that uh, final time trial was, you know, Roglic was, was doing okay. He was doing absolutely fine un- unless you, you, he was aware, you know, until the moment that he was aware that Pogacar was making such gains. And then your um, description of it as sinking, Rich, I think is, is good because suddenly what he was doing was not enough. And it was slipping away, slipping away, slipping away. And and I think the moment it becomes a proper crack is symbolised by just the helmet slipping and, and the way he looked. He did look ragged. He looked like it had just mm. all got away from him. In, he in, looked pale. On the final, he looked yeah. pale, and, didn't And he? that would have been the, the fact that it was sinking in, that he, he you know, he had managed, oh, well, you know, victory had slipped away uh, in quite a dramatic fashion and he'd just not been able to uh, keep a, a, a grasp on it and it didn't happen in a, you know a minute or a kilometer it happened slowly probably without realizing at first and then when perhaps he did realize it was too late to respond and then the more he tried to kind of rein in the losses you know the losses are not coming in at all and in fact going the other way and then the panic sets in you can just uh, without even um, you know being party to what he was thinking on the on the climb you can just imagine um, that the every effort to try and limit those losses it, we say it so glibly don't I can, we just, I can imagine what I can imagine his, his little internal monologue just going shit 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 <laughs> Well, it what it would you would pay a you pay a pretty penny to really be able to unpick that. What what did he think yeah. at every moment? It's it, it's a real fascinating question, but, and we probably won't get the answer from Roglic himself necessarily. You know, while he is a rider, but maybe one day he will be able to go through that. You know, it might be a a sort of a, almost a therapy session for him at some point, um, depending on how the rest of his career goes. But just fascinating to. Th- 
to think about the, the the mental process suddenly sort of 55 minutes must have felt like it was over in the blink of an eye and yet sort of an interminable length of time you know it must have been remember remember for, I, I just just very quickly brief on that remember in for when he's in the funeral when hugh grant sleeps in and he's late for a wedding and the the, the sheer panic and the kind of muttering and swearing under his breath as he realizes the the implications of this and races the car that's why i imagine uh roglic's well, it's, internal it's, monologue his bike change looked a bit like that didn't it um <laughs> But easy, very easy chaps to say after the event. But that morning, I was slightly worried for Rog because um, I'd been dispatched to the to the foot of the climb because, um, well, riders were doing their recons and um, for ITV I was working for, and we, we wanted some footage of teams, riders practicing bike changes. So we stationed ourselves on the bottom of the climb and, and, and I spoke to someone from UAE that morning and they said, um, change of plan, Tade. Pog is not going to do a, a recon and then um, shortly after that we saw Rog come through looking very very focused more f- sort of focused and like he was doing more of a kind of proper a proper recon a proper trial um, dry run um, than the previous riders we'd seen that morning and um, you know I just had this kind of image in my head of, of Pog in the sort of spirit of you know spontaneity and nonchalance in which he'd ridden the Tour de France sort of you know being Sat, sat up in bed with his bowl of cornflakes watching whack a day very relaxed um and and just you know having carrying having no real anxiety about the day and then we'd seen rog go past looking very tense and also you know there was this narrative there had been this narrative about him um weakening in the last week and and weakening particularly in the, the final time trial of grand tours and I just, you could almost feel some of that tension again, you know, with 2020 hindsight. hindsight. Um, and, and, you know, sure enough, um, well, the, 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 the respective performances um, that day seemed to, seem to bear that out. You know, Pogacar, almost a sort of happy-go-lucky kind of approach to the time trial, and um, which you know bore fruit and then and then rog kind of cramping up and looking sort of well just just knotted in, in with with tension um but i one thing it does strike me is that maybe the, the what happened at the vuelta where he did hang on roglic perversely does that debunk the theory of a choke because even there we saw and and i think this almost proved beyond doubt that he does struggle right at the end of of grand tours and it, could it simply have been, was it simply, and should it be remembered simply as, you know, further evidence of that at the Tour de France that he, he was just running out of running out of fuel at that point? Well, just one final thing from that day, because uh, another image was of, of Rog at the at the finish, you know, having crossed the line and, and suffered this devastating loss. Um, his first reaction, his first instinct was to get up and go and congratulate Pog and I think in that moment he made himself a lot more popular than if he'd actually won the tour, um, because it really showed that it was the measure of him. You know, we don't we don't get a lot from Rog. Uh, he's pretty inscrutable. He doesn't give a lot away, but we sort of, I guess, got a sense of of who he is in that moment, and it was uh, it reflected very well on him. I thought his 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 attitude, his his that his first response was to go and give Pog a very sincere kind of. Congratulations. Shoot, uh, shoot that arrière du peloton, cycling podcast team car, the back of the pack, please. That's said PK, the voice of Radio Tour, to remind me to tell you that this episode is sponsored by Harry's. Richard, you're always raving about shaving with Harry's razors. Oh, that's nice wordplay there, Lionel. <laughs> um, well, I have to tell you, I am a Harry's customer, as you know, and the other day uh, we moved to France fairly recently, well, recently enough that we haven't unpacked everything yet. I was running low on my um, Harry's uh, cartridges and I found a stash in a box and I was so happy because wow. it meant that I didn't have to go out and buy some terrible French razors. <laughs> oh dear. Oh dear. No offence. No uh, offence, France. Like a sort of a little Aladdin's cave, I imagine you unpacking and that would be just mm. uh, just un- just uncovering those replacement cartridges. That's made another, my day. another few months. Really, what you're saying, Rich, is if I smartened up my act and started shaving again, I should do so with Harry's. 
Uh, yeah, definitely. It's a very, very pleasing experience. Um, I always enjoy shaving with Harry's. Um, Jeff and Andy, who set up Harry's, bought their own factory in Germany, uh, a factory that's been making sh uh, razor blades for 100 years now, say that they've released recently their sharpest ever blades. And they're the same price. Replacement blades are as little as £1.75 each. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy with my Harry's shaves. It keeps me fresh face, as you know, Lionel. Well, although I'm going more for the tough paper round look, Rich, uh, with my grizzled face, I have recommended Harry's razors to other people and they've been very happy, um, starting off with the trial set and then uh, graduating to getting the replacement blades delivered to their door. So you don't even have to sort of put them in the supermarket trolley or add them to the supermarket shop. They turn up um, periodically as you need to replace them replace them so uh, a, a very good system and if you'd like to give it a go you can get started with a trial set which includes richard well it includes a weighted ergonomic handle uh, a f new five blade razor cartridge uh, rich lathering shave gel and the travel blade cover to protect your blades on the move so to get the comfortable shave that you deserve, head to harrys.com forward slash cycling to claim a trial set for just £3.95. You'll also be supporting the cycling podcast by doing so. Again, head to harrys.com forward slash cycling. Well, my moment of the year is a, a more somber one, but also kind of fitting for this uh, COVID ravaged year. Um, Lanciano, start of stage 10 of the Giro d'Italia uh, followed the first rest day um, in Abruzzo. We had a lovely day there, a um, very nice meal in one of these kind of huts um, in in the sea, built out into the sea, a fish, fisherman's hut that, that, that kind of dot that coast. Yes, Rich, uh, called Traboc uh, Trabocchi. Trabocchi, and uh, very cold, but it was nice. Um, and we went to Lanciano the next morning, um, knowing that the... The COVID tests had just been announced, and there there were fears at the Giro that the protocols weren't weren't quite as as well managed as they'd been at the Tour de France. I'd done an interview on the rest day with Jos van Emden of Jumbo Visma, where he'd been very scathing, in fact, about some of the hotels they'd stayed in and the contact they'd had with the public. And we got to the start in uh, Lanciano, having having learned that Stephen Croiswick had tested positive for coronavirus this was a few days after simon yates had tested positive and there were a couple more positive cases on his team mitchell and scott so they decided to withdraw from the race we got to the start in lanciano small town and yumbo visma were there um and we went to the the sort of mix zone um intercepting the riders as they went down to sign on i spoke to alex dowsett i remember about his stage win a couple of days earlier and um gradually it dawned on us that no Jumbo Visma rider had appeared to sign on and they seemed to be all still on the bus and then there was a whisper that they were actually not going to take the start and Addy Engels uh, walked past us looking very stern faced and serious and uh, with real purpose um, and he went to see the organization and told them that they had decided not to start and then he came back to speak to us and I, I was really struck by how um, how serious his demeanour was. It was obviously a huge decision and um, and a really difficult decision uh, to pull out of a, a grand tour. And and it felt it felt hugely significant. Um, you know, at that moment, just a week into a three week race with two teams out and several other cases, I really didn't think the Giro was going to make it to Milan. And I thought Engels spoke very well, explaining that they felt they were doing. That they were they were pulling out for the benefit of the race to give the race a chance, and they felt like it was the they felt that it was the responsible thing to do to pull out the race. Um, so it was a very uh, very somber. Now it it does seem amazing that the Giro kind of you know dusted itself off, carried on, and did make it to Milan, and it ended up being obviously a terrific race. I think when we look back on this season, Rich, um, my my image as far as kind of COVID is concerned will be a different one. Um, it would be from Paris Nice, and um, because at that point in the year, in so in March when the the pandemic was really well cranking up all across Europe, we really didn't know what we were dealing with, and it did feel quite apocalyptic. And um, as the the days had gone past, the, the, there'd been more and more 
measures um, introduced, announced, and the crowds had been sort of cleared away completely. And we were going through parts of France, which are very quiet anyway. And then we got to um, stage five and Lawson Craddock had abandoned the race near the end of the stage. And then um, just as we were wrapping up our our interviews after the finish, um, we heard a rumour that Lawson Craddock was being tested for COVID. And then we, we got a glimpse of him being sort of um kind of bundled into the back of an ambulance to do this test and then you know he was taken away with sort of sirens wailing and it really did feel quite apocalyptic and i don't know if you've seen a lot of people have, have re-watched it since the start of the pandemic the film Con- um, contagion um, which is an eerily sort of similar foreshadowing of what we've been through this year i think the, the film was made in about 2011 but it felt very much like that so that would be my image of this very strange year i felt you know by the time we got to the Giro, we sort of knew um what we were dealing with i mean we uh, personally we'd done a few races by that point and um you know it, it was an unfortunate but but we we, we always felt the Giro, didn't we that it was it was on a knife edge the whole time well that sort of leads to my moment of the year which was super sunday sunday october the 18th and um, I'd been thinking about how COVID-19 had kept the crowds away uh, to a great extent at the Tour de France and how we'd all talked, hadn't we, about how road racing really wasn't all that diminished when compared to some other sports by the absence of spectators. Now, that's not to say that there isn't something magical about watching a race from the side of the road and there isn't something added to um, the atmosphere and the experience of watching a race And, you know, when the riders are going up the mountains, you know, through a corridor of spectators, you know, that has its good and its uh, less good points, I think. But in terms of the television spectacle, cycling wasn't harmed, I didn't feel, uh, by the absence of spectators on the roadside. Uh, Certainly not as as much as, say, football, which, you know, a stadium sport uh, played in front of no spectators or as we've we've seen in recent weeks just a couple of thousand people allowed into some games you know it's not the same um experience and there's, there's a sense watching football that the actual sport is diminished because there aren't people what's you know watching it there's just something lacking there, whether it be um you know the, the sense that the players pick up on a sort of echoey arena and 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 it's just not as perhaps full-blooded it's not as meaningful maybe whereas uh, the the grand tours and the classics went ahead i felt in a sporting sense um it very much in the the same way and i think super sunday which was uh, stage 15 of the giro to piancavallo which was won by teo gagan hart ahead of the two sunweb riders wilco kelderman and jai hindley and that was a day when joao almeida really dug very very deep rode heroically to Uh, cling on to his pink jersey by 15 seconds it was a real cracking um, stage of a a Giro that was starting to um, you know bubble pretty nicely by that stage with with a week to go and that taking place on the same afternoon as the the Tour of Flanders which finally gave us this head-to-head between Matthew van der Poel and Wout van Aert which I guess everyone's been waiting for for a long time to to see their rivalry which lasted a long time in cyclocross goes back to almost a decade really I mean the pair of them were on the podium at the junior cyclocross world championships back in 2012 when van der Poel won and van Aert was second they went head-to-head in so many cyclocross races um you know the they've won three world cyclocross titles each and uh with both of them having uh you know a, a real uh you know quality in the classic races we were anticipating the the beginning of a van der Poel van Aert rivalry which could last many years and we we finally saw them uh, head to head in the tour of flanders um if you think about when the sport returned after lockdown, you know, Wout van Aert really hit the ground running, didn't he? He won uh, very impressive at Strada Bianca, very impressive at Milan San Remo. But, but it seemed everything that Wout van Aert could do, Matthew van der Poel was doing something equally impressive. The Bink Bank Tour, he won with a, a sensational solo break on the final day, a little bit overshadowed because that was also the first day of the Giro d'Italia. And so everything was set up for... Um, the Tour of Flanders and the, the pair of them got away with Julian Alaphilippe and then Alaphilippe came to grief when uh, he clipped that motorcycle and that left the two of them 
out in front on their own and it was a sort of 40 kilometer guessing game who was going to do what would they try to attack one another would they leave it to the sprint and in the end they left it to the sprint and well it came down to what less than half a wheel it was a real close finish Matthew van der Poel got it um, you know, Wout van Aert's day will surely come. But um, what that said to me really was that the the racing was the star a lot of the time over this uh, condensed and very intense um, period of racing from the start of August through to uh, the beginning of November. Um, the the absence of fans was was felt in some ways, but didn't um, diminish the the actual spectacle. But then, as a television sport, you know, spoiled with this kind of afternoon of great racing one event after another and yet in the kind of final analysis neither um, uh, Matthew van der Poel's Tour of Flanders win uh, nor Theo Gegenhart's stage win and, and in actual fact his Giro d'Italia win um, as well because by the time he was clinching the the Giro the Vuelta was already underway I do feel that that was a lesson for pro cycling as well it, going forward the emphasis should be on giving the best uh, events you know soul status in the spotlight so that we can really kind of absorb um, the classics the grand tours and the major stage races uh, without all of these different things kind of competing for attention because I do feel that both of those uh, days racing kind of took a little bit away from each other what, yeah, what? we would have been celebrating van der Poel's fantastic head-to-head victory over van Aert probably a bit more had we not just been pressing on again with the Giro well, a couple of yeah, days later. It's like a state, when you're at a stage race, um, you, you know, the, 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 the day before is very quickly forgotten, isn't it? It's one of, the, one of the good things about it, about going back to, to revisit some of these things. But you're mentioning uh, the lack of crowds. You know, when I think of the three outstanding images of the year, when you talk about the Tour of Flanders, there was some fantastic photography that day. There, there always is great photography at the... At the tour of Flanders of the crowd, the crowds, you know, the on the climbs and the riders kind of threading their way through, but the the photography, the images of of Van der Poel and Van Aert together uh, against a, a kind of naked landscape were absolutely stunning. As were the pictures from Imola um, at the World Championships, Anna van der Breggen on the the Saturday and Juliana Philippe on the the Sunday. Probably the Anna van der Breggen sequence. It wasn't really a still. It was you know the shot from the helicopter was was even better for you know the light it was just right and it looked amazing and then the third one would be uh gagan hart rowan dennis and jai hindley up the stelvio um you know with with no uh spectators at all it, it just it sort of took it into the realms of mountaineering or something you know it was like it was like an assault on everest rather than a a, a climb in a grand tour it was it was different but very very um Almost like the the fifties, yeah, you know? it the, was the, the shots of Coppy and Bartoli together. Just the the, I mean, the, the the great thing about the races is it is this marriage of humanity, the the riders and the landscape. But I think you can you can take the crowds away and and the battle of the you know the, that solitude of the riders against the landscape still stands up. I think mm. and that tracking shot at Imola that you mentioned. I mean, it was it was jaw dropping, mm. wasn't it? I mean, it was and it's and it's it stood repeating mm. over. Uh, both the races and that probably wouldn't have been possible no, with crowds no. because the the crowds would have been stood on the road kind of getting in the way of the yeah. the perfect arty shot yeah. um so there there were some positives to come to come out of that not that i'm saying that that cycling should be a sport that should be held behind behind closed doors uh, in the future but um you know in terms of um watching the racing it, it did feel different and we'll be able to well, assume, assuming that in 2021 things return to a little bit uh, closer to normal, um, we'll be able to date those photographs, yeah. won't we? In 30 years' time, we'll just be able to say, well, that's obviously 2020 because there's nobody there. And Lionel, you talk about the lack of crowds at Flanders and the lack of maybe lack of hype and fanfare both before and after, because you know that's a big aspect, particularly of the of the classics, the number of people at the side of the road, the amount of attention and interest in Belgium in particular. But um, to to me, the the nature of this season, the way races one race rolled immediately into the next one, and you know these these um, these huge races that were overlapping that. That almost made, that helped make for me Primoz Roglic the, the perfect sort of emblematic figure of this race, uh, sorry, of this season because 
Um, you know, he's someone who does just roll from race to race. He rolled from victory to victory. He has this very sort of stoic um, air about him, not really interested in the fanfare. Um, the, the the landscape in Primoz Roglic's head, you think, you, you feel the way he approaches the sport is almost as desolate as those landscapes um, that you describe. Not in the sense that there's nothing going on there, but in the sense that, you know, his conception of the sport seems to me very sort of stripped down and very kind of appealing for that reason. There is no, there's no kind of fuss. And um, so I think he, you know, he almost epitomizes, personifies this as this year and um, the other thing you're talking about photos i mean if we were to talk about photos of the year very significant sort of photos that we we each took in our our mind's eye one that i don't think i'll forget is um the image um as the the giro d'italia was was leaving enna um mm. on stage what was it three, stage three. three or four of the three of the giro d'italia rich and i had had gone wrong we'd taken the wrong road, um to, yeah to trying to get out of the start and we'd stopped at a junction and we saw Theo Gegenhart looking around, fairly looking over his shoulder in a fairly panicked fashion, it looked to us, um, as though something had gone wrong, something had happened. We didn't know at that point that about 500 metres further up the road, um, Geraint Thomas had crashed. And um, yeah, what a significant mm. um, turn of events that, that proved to be because... Um, at that moment, neither he nor we could possibly have imagined that that was his gateway to Giro glory opening up. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport. Fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science in Sport, our longtime supporter. We're grateful to them for their support and do stock up on your Science in Sport products using the discount code 25% off with the code SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. That's SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. Um, just before we move on, and we're going to hear from a young writer, Joe Laverick, in a minute. He is a young British writer who rode for the AG2, AG2R development team this year, but is uh, joining a, a new team for next year, not yet announced. And he's going to live in Girona and... Uh, is concerned about uh, what impact uh, Brexit might have on on him. And he put a shout out on social media um, about that and looking for advice. So I thought I'd get his um, thoughts uh, about it. So we'll hear from him in a moment. Um, Just Sorry, Daniel. Well, we're not going to speak about Brexit, are we? Because if I would, if you put me on the spot and you ask me about Brexit, you get a, a rant very similar to, I don't know if you heard overnight, um, Tom Cruise's rant about the... Um, people not observing COVID protocols on the set of Mission Impossible Seven. Um, well, we'll not we'll for, not do that. We'll not do that. You know, it's, it's, it's Christmas, Daniel. We're we're going to go into Christmas quiz quite soon. That'll put everyone in a really good mood. I'll tell you what, after um, the quiz, Dan, we, after the quiz, Daniel can talk about Brexit, and we'll just ask the producer just to fade him down gradually. After. Fade that out. <laughs> well, well, yeah. Before we hear from Joel. <clears throat> um, Thanks to everybody who's signed up as a friend of the podcast, who's renewed or, or signed up as a new friend of the podcast. Um, it's £15. Uh, that's uh, an annual fee, and it'll gain you access to all our latest friend specials and quite a few old ones as well. There's quite a big back catalogue, about 25 episodes on there now. The next episode comes out this week, The Fan Clubs. It's a, a very detailed look at uh, rider fan clubs with our listener, Nigel Manson, who suggested the idea. And it has been fantastic fun, I have to say. Um, and it sort of ends with the, a call to action to the podcast listeners to, to to run, to set up a couple of fan clubs for a male and a female rider. And we, we've kind of made a start with, with one of them. So I don't want to sp spoil it, but um, it's, it's a really fun listen and it was fun to do. Um, if you become a good friend or a best friend of the podcast, i.e. if you pay a bit more, £50 or £100, you'll get... Uh, either a casket or a tea towel if you pay £50 or both if you pay £100. Now, they're not being sent out yet, are they, Lionel? You're sending them all out yourself. I, I, I did the be. books last year. You're doing these items this mm, year. I will be, yeah. Well, ev pe everyone who's uh, signing up or ha their subscription is renewing, uh, just on that, actually, uh, the if you're an existing friend, your subscription will renew automatically on the anniversary that you signed up, uh, unless you disable that option. So um, any problems, just contact us 
uh, contact at thecyclingpodcast.com. Uh, but if you can refrain from asking about the tea towel and casket just for the moment, because what we will do is when we are in possession of the tea towel, the tea towel is in production now and, and won't be available until we think around mid-January. Uh, but once we've got both items in our possession, we will be emailing all 50 and 100 pound friends uh, the £50 friends will be asked to make their choice of which gift they would like and everyone will be asked to send us their postal address so that we can post out those gifts. So uh, just uh, hold fire for now and we will do all of that in mid-January. Uh, another bit of business on the Friends of the Podcast systems because if you remember we switched over from our rather um, homemade system uh, it, which we ran from 2015 to 2019. It was an individual feed each year. Uh, we upgraded it some what for 2020 and now it's this kind of rolling system uh, much easier to add to your uh, device and get access to the friends specials as a result of our upgrade to this new system we're taking the 2015 to 2019 feeds offline sometime towards the end of january um, if you would like to save any of the episodes that are on those feeds uh, you can do so uh, you'll be able to just download them in in the normal way if you don't know how to do that check out our newsletter this week there'll be instructions in there so that if you want to just make sure you don't lose access to one of your episodes perhaps one of your favorites from those years um, you'll be able to download them and uh, keep them store them on your computer or your phone or whatever um, but over the next however many months we'll be adding some of the back catalog to the uh, existing friends of the podcast feed won't we Richard we've already done that with some of the most popular episodes we'll carry on sort of transferring things across in due time yes and we've got some new friend specials coming out soon as well so stay tuned for details um, we'll be putting out a Christmas bonus episode next week as well a chat with Amara Terra the band that provide our Giro d'Italia music um, they were in the news recently because they were booked to do a, a Strictly Come Dancing kind of spin-off show, um, but the BBC uh, were not offering them any any fee, uh, so they didn't they didn't do it. And that story made the Guardian and uh, provoked quite a big reaction from our listeners. Um, and in that episode next week, you'll find out how if you want to support Amara Terra or you know show your appreciation for their music, which has made such a fantastic contribution to our coverage over the the last five years, I think. Um, we'll tell you how to do so. So that's coming next week, a little treat. Um, but let's hear from Joe Laverick. He's just turned 20. I mean, I feel for riders who are junior or under 23, they've missed a year, basically. Um, and th th these are important years for these guys if they want to become professional riders. Joe does. Um, he's a young British rider. He's made plans to go to, uh, to, to live in Girona next year. Um, but... You know, he kind of falls between, is he a professional amateur? Um, will he be allowed to go and live there uh, under the, the new uh, conditions, depending on what, if any, Brexit deal is got? Um, and he, he asked on social media whether anybody had any advice for him. So I thought I'd phone him up and just find out um, what he knows and what he's thinking about um, his year, his hope for a year in Girona next year. Quick update on Joe before we hear from him. He has signed for 2021 for Hagen's Berman Action, the development team run by Axel Merckx. Very famous development team now because so many of the winners of big races recently have come through that system. He wasn't sure he could say when I spoke to him that he'd signed for them, but it's out there now. So Joe will ride for Hagen's Berman Action in 2021. Established pros who are on contracts and so on, it, it, it's there'll be a lot more kind of certainty but for for other guys um who want to base themselves in europe um you know next year um british guys i mean it, it there's a lot of uncertainty and I, I just wondered how that was you know weighing on your mind and, and making you sort of anxious about about next year um yeah so to be honest i hadn't really thought about it until yesterday really i mean mum had mentioned it and we'd looked into it but it hadn't really occurred to me that it'll be a massive issue because I was like, well, some it'll figure itself out. It always will. Um, but then I was watching the news yesterday and it was like, oh, this might happen and that might happen. I think that's the issue. It's all the uncertainty, isn't it? Mm. 
And, and can, um, can you find? I mean, did, did you glean anything from Twitter? Or have you been able to find out anything? I guess I guess nobody really knows yet. Um, well, that's the issue. So I went on the government website, and that said it will be updated in due course. Um, well, what's the date today? Like December the eleventh or whatever, twelfth. I don't know. Um, the eleventh, and I mean, we're potentially coming out in what for nineteen, twenty days. Um, and the government still haven't updated their website because I don't think they know yet. And I emailed a immigration lawyer in Jerome today, and she said, if you move out now, we can maybe rush it through. Maybe. It'll be expensive. Um, however, we don't really know what's going to happen after January the 1st, so we'll just have to judge it then and have a meeting with you once you arrive and once we know. So what, I mean, at the moment, you have you got accommodation arranged in Girona? Yeah, so I've got everything sorted. I'm sharing with another rider who's already based there. Um, and he's fine because he's got an Irish passport. Um, but yeah, I'm due to go out January the 6th. So I was reading about this potential travel ban. And it's a little bit stressful, but I think I'll be able to get away with it because I don't know, technically, I suppose I can claim pro. I mean, that's an argument in itself, isn't it? Uh, um, being Conti, is it pro or isn't it pro? But um, my plan at the minute is to go out and so the correct thing to do, just wing it and find out what happens when I'm there kind of thing and try and get residency because what I suppose if I think about it properly, the worst thing that could happen is I go out there in January, do my 90 out of 180 days, which is supposedly the uh, the regulations, and then get to March and I've got to come home and I can't go back out for race season. Um, I mean, that's a, I don't think that's going to happen, but that is, I suppose, a possibility. How I'm thinking of it is Australians and Americans have, before they've, they've obviously lived in Spain and guys have managed to get residency in Spain. Um, I mean, I know this is different because World Tour guys are going to be making um, multiple times um, what I will be. So it's a little bit more clear. Um, but I suppose you could argue that even, say, someone on Mitchelton or whatever they're called these days, they don't technically have to be based in Girona full time for their job. Um, I mean, from our perspective, you do. But it's not like there's, a, there's an office there or anything. Um, and they've still managed to get residency. Um, but yeah, it's an awkward one because there's not even any guidance on what your annual salary has to be or anything to get residency. It kind of just seems to be, well, this is what happened while we were in the EU. What's going to happen next? Oh, well, uh, we'll wait and see on January the 1st and let you know, which is not helpful at all, is it? And not nice, I would imagine, when, you know, you're you're putting so much work into 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 training and, and preparing and, and really making huge sacrifices to, to pursue this dream, I suppose, of, of being a professional cyclist. This is one, you know, any kind of uncertainty is unhelpful, but this this must be something that, that could have and maybe is having quite a negative effect on your state of mind. Yeah, it's just frustrating. As I said, I'm possibly slightly naively um, convinced that all is going to be okay because... As you alluded to earlier, we're all thinking kind of worst case scenario. Um, I think it's in, well, politics, I don't want to go into, but I think it's in everyone's best interest to kind of have some sort of open gateway. But um, yeah, it's weighing my mind a little bit because I, I want to be living out in Girona both for like training. It's easier to get to races. It's easier to get home from races with the airport. And you're surrounded by like-minded people. Um, and that's the thing in Grimsby, don't get me wrong, the Lincolnshire Walls are a beautiful place to ride. Um, and there's countless, countless farm tracks and hundreds of miles of empty roads. But there's not the community here. Um, and I think I think I'd, I'd be a better cyclist living out in Girona. Um, and yeah, whether, whether that happens or not, well, I suppose we won't know for another month. Well, that was Joe Laverick. Um, if anyone's got any advice for him, let us know. Uh, not sure anybody does, though. Um, listen, Christmas quiz, chaps. I've been inspired by Rose Manley, but I cannot emulate 
her fantastic quiz, which featured in this month's cycling podcast, Femina, which just came out this week. It was very, very well done and entertaining. This is a lot more hastily put together. Just getting my excuses in first. But I've, I've devised a few questions um, for both of you. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be crap, but go on. <laughs> are you quite, are you quite, well, quite competitive? Are you quite competitive, both of you, when it comes to this kind what, of thing? What kind of questions can we expect? I don't know. Is it... Um, I don't know. Is there, a, is there a Pavel Tonkov round? There isn't. There, there, there isn't even... There aren't even rounds as such. They're just, they're just questions. I mean, you Go know, on. all I've done is come up with the question. It's up to you two to be entertaining and oh. funny. Um, Lionel, are you competitive? Um, well, if you remember, we played Scrabble with Ned Bolting last year. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, you are competitive. Yeah. yeah, Christmas special last year. I oh, yeah. really fancied Sorry, my chances in that, and it turned out to be a lot harder mm. than I imagined to make cy- professional cycling-related words from uh, the selection of Scrabble tiles. <laughs> it was difficult, wasn't it? I can't remember who won, but I suspect if I'd won, I think I won. I'd remember. So I obviously didn't yeah. win. <laughs> okay, well, this is a bit different. Um, shall we get straight into it, chaps? Go you on, ready? Yeah. Okay. Summer, summer for Lionel, summer okay. for Daniel, and summer for both. Okay. Okay, Lionel, first question. What is Mitch Docker's favourite beer? Oh, goodness. Oh, these are, these are horrible bouncers, these questions, aren't they? I should know. I should know that. I well, think, yeah, I, think I, I, know. I think I might know. I think I might know. All right, okay. Bonus, bonus point for Lionel. Daniel, I mean. Uh, is it is it an Alhambra? Nope. Ah. Oh. I anything anything cold and wet. I will say. <laughs> Orval. Of course it is. Of course it is. That's the, yeah. That's my favourite Belgian beer as well. Uh, should have known that. Uh, honorary point for knowing that, but not being able to answer it. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, Daniel. What is in a butter pie? Uh, uh, pastry. I don't know. I've no idea. Pastry and sausage. Beep. I don't know. I've no idea. I, I know. Final this. bonus point. Yeah, it's uh, it's potato and onion. Well, I actually spoke to Hugh Carthy last week, and uh, this this actually brings the first two questions together because he mentions Mitch Docker in here. Let's hear what he had to say about butter pies. Have you enjoyed any butter pies since you've been back? I'm not a pie yet. No, I'm not. I'm not I'm not being. Uh, I went past that bakery the day. I sent Mitch a picture of it, and he wasn't very impressed. Uh, he said he looked a bit dodgy. I can't remember what the word he used, but rough or something. I can't remember. Uh, but yeah. I went by. I go. I go. I go next week. I'll get home to. I'll get some. Dad to. I'll get some. Okay. Question for both of you. I fear that you might know this quite easily because we talked about this earlier on. Fingers on the buzzers, please. By how much time did Pog win the time trial at La Planche de Belfi? Uh, 121. Oh, suspiciously, suspiciously accurate. Did you look that up? No, I just remembered. I just remembered. Did you? Yeah. Okay. You're all, yes. you're all square. Come on. Okay. Okay, Lionel, which country has the most riders in the men's world top 20? These are the UCI rankings. Which country? Um, Belgium. Uh, uh, Daniel, um, I'm gonna say, mm, mm, I'm gonna say. You're looking. You, oh, you, you no, look like no. you're looking at a computer screen. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely appalling. I could see his eyes darting back and forth. I don't know. Uh, it, um, Slovenia, France, okay, France, okay. France okay. four. Um, Daniel, how many Italians are there in the men's top twenty? Um, I would say. So, oh God, this shows how little I know about the UCI rankings. I don't even know where they calculated uh, just on twenty twenty season. Um, I'm going to say one. You're correct. Do you know who it is? I would say Diego Ulisi. Oh, you're right. Yeah, you get get one and a half points for that, I think. Um, okay, chaps, the next uh, round is a literary, a literary question. Okay, from which book is this passage? This is... Mark Cavendish, Boy Racer. No, sorry, sorry. Go on. 
If only I'd come down with a puncture, how often, fighting away in a long-beaten peloton that nonetheless lay down a hellish tempo I could barely follow, have I longed for a flat tyre, a puncture, permission from beyond to stop the dying. For years, something kept me from talking to other riders about that longing, but when I did, it turned out they all knew the feeling. A lot of praying goes on in the peloton. Please let me get a puncture. But the speed of prayer has its limits, so the rider occasionally resorts to more drastic measures, He pounds his wheels through potholes, through gravel, searches for sharp rocks, and perchance, when he has a race to ride but no morale, he'll even mount a carefully selected tube that's ready to blow. Richard Moore, my story? (laughs) More Lionel Burney, I think, that, but... uh... (laughs) Is that The Rider? The Rider by Tim Crabby. Well done, yeah. Which we featured in an episode of Kilometre Zero at the Tour de France, of Help, course, and even spoke the fact to the that, author yeah, himself. Read it, read it, I read it this, or reread it this summer. Um, yeah, just, yeah. Ooh, ooh, yeah. Okay. Okay, very good. Well done, Lionel. Um, Lionel, who said there have been three sprint stages so far and we've won four of them? It's bound to be somebody. It's bound, that sounds like the sort of thing Patrick Lefebvre would say. <laughs> Someone I'm, wasn't listening to our Giro podcast, know, was he? Uh, I know the answer. <laughs> Come on, Daniel. Um, it's Jacopo Guarnieri. Correct. He said that during the Giro oh, of d'Italia. Course he did. Um, of course he did. Daniel, Daniel, who said the following and what were they talking about? Everyone's a gangster until a real gangster walks in. Uh, that's probably something I said. <laughs> Correct. And was it about... Was it about... Something it, to do with it was about rain, rain, Everesting. Uh, no. It was about oh, yes. Alberto Contador Everesting. Um, Correct. Well done, Lionel. Your knowledge of Daniel is uh, gains you a point there. Um, so you are your your level on three points each, I think. Um, Lionel, hang on, lost my questions. <laughs> Lionel, who is the top ranked Colombian? in the world on the UCI rankings and what place is he in? Oh. Um. On the UCI rankings? Yeah. Without looking it up. I'm not, well, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not looking it up, Richard. I'm, I'm scrolling <laughs> through the pull down menus in my mind to think who's had the best results of the Colombians this year and it's a a surprising one it's a surprising one is it is it still Egan Bernal it is not well put you out your misery yeah go on then I think it's Danny Martinez correct Daniel Ah. do you know what what position he's in um he wouldn't be in the top 20 um I don't know 25 34th Mm. quite surprising Okay, next question for Daniel. Yes. Daniel, what is the science and sport discount code? Oh, The real tragedy of this is I genuinely don't know. Uh, oh, nonsense. I Absolute genuinely don't nonsense. know. TCP uh, 25. SIS oh. CP 25. Where do I get the TCP from? <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, both of you, from which book is this passage? Due to a set of circumstances that are probably linked to the whims of fate and about which is now too late to complain, he who today writes this article as a reporter assigned to follow the Giro d'Italia has never seen a bicycle road uh, race. This is the Dino Buzzati 1949 Giro d'Italia book. I don't know what the title of it is, but it's a collection. The Giro d'Italia. Correct. Yeah. Co- a collection of Dino Buzzati's writings on the 1949 Giro. Okay. I, also, uh, another I, also, question for... I did also have that. I was that was on. Yeah, I yeah. got that one. <laughs> oh well, <laughs> this is terrible. But it wasn't for me. Uh, okay, both of you. Um, how many wins Pos- did Movie Star achieve this year? World Tour really, or not I'm, World Tour? World Tour. I'm still just reeling World from Tour. that. That little. Actually, actually, no. I think it might just be wins. Um, Sorry, I think. Uh, I can. Uh, I think I can name them. I think there were. Th- yeah. Three, three, three. Mark Soler in the Challenge Mallorca. Mark Soler in Stage Two of the Vuelta. And 
I think that no, I think there are only two. I think there are only two. Two, correct, so, correct. So not just two wins, not even world tour. You're gonna give yourself um, that one, Lionel. Another Trumpian, <laughs> another Trumpian. Yeah, I've given yeah, that one. Cause on, <laughs> what is? Okay, yeah, because on on his way to three, he passed two. So, so uh, yeah. Well, okay. When, when's two. when's Lionel's inauguration? I must be. I must Who now have the... an unassailable lead. No, in this quiz, we could we could probably stop there. Who had the most? Who had the most race days this year, and how many? Oh, oh that's... well, that's very difficult, isn't it? Um, I'm uh, going to say Peo Bilbao, and I'm going to say 65. You're right with Peo Bilbao. Seriously? Wow. Yeah. Wow. And how 71. many? 71. Oh, wow. That was a guess. I was going to guess Tim de Klerk. I don't know why. How, do you know how many race days he had? No, I don't know. But uh, that ties in with our latest friend special, not to give too much away. Uh, is there, how, many, li- how many questions um, left? No, I can just, just three left. I, can, three I, left. I, only ask, sorry, I only ask because I can really feel the suspense building. Well, <laughs> um, it might come down to the last question. Lionel, how many Irishmen won World Tour races this season? Sam Bennett, Dan Martin... Two. Correct. Daniel, yes. which Scots which Scotsman has joined the Sunweb development team for twenty twenty one? Oh God. Oh, this feels like a um if he's listening, um I'm sorry, this feels like a terrible affront. <laughs> um Um Oh God. Sorry, I just keep thinking of Mark Donovan. No, I don't I don't I've forgotten his name. Oscar Only from uh, 18 he's from Kelso in the Scottish borders and uh, good luck to him okay final question I mean uh, it's finally poised because Daniel you were on seven and Lionel you were on four but Daniel you lose three points for not knowing the science and sport code so it's (laughs) it's all level (laughs) going into the final question Uh, fingers on the buzzers please who this year descended like a goat Uh, hey. Um. Uh, beep, beep. Uh, il knew a <laughs> Certainly wasn't Lionel Burney. <laughs> uh, correct, Lionel. Who said it? Who who claimed it? Was it Nans Peters? Oh, Lionel's the winner. Oh. Lionel wins the quiz. Oh, fantastic! <laughs> Sorry, I mean, Daniel. <laughs> It, very, very much <laughs> a sort of a bit like a grand tour that settled on time bonuses. I possibly didn't mm. answer the most questions correctly, yet I've come out on top as the winner. Can we have a? S- you've navigate. You've navigated your way around the. Uh, Can we have a second the, referendum? Uh, Can we have a revote? You need a. You need a sort of Rudy Giuliani figure now, Daniel, to take your case to the to the courts <laughs> and appeal. <laughs> anyway, there we go. Well, thanks, go. Chris. That's it. That That's the Christmas quiz. Thoroughly really enjoyable. I feel about yeah, ready as good for, as a, for a glass but... of sherry now, Rich. After that, I <laughs> feel very festive. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! Well, I've got a year to prepare for next year's one now. So, uh, well, that's our last proper episode, isn't it, of the year? We'll be back in twenty twenty one, won't we? We will. Will we? We will. Of course, we will. Yeah. Um, Cut. Calling it a proper proper episode might be slightly generous, but anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, oh well, it's been a it's been an interesting year, hasn't it, chaps? It's been a very interesting year. Yes, so all that uncertainty in the spring about whether there'd be any racing to cover and what we would do, uh, creating our Giro. Which, you know, as I look back over the year now, that was one of the highlights of the year. Even though, you know, I didn't leave my home, it felt like we traveled around italy and uh speaking of that i remember promising that we would put the full version of the max chiandri interview on the friends of the podcast feed so richard remind me to get that organized and we'll put that out sometime between christmas and new year um a little dose of italian sunshine from max chiandri probably go down quite well over the festive period for people um but yeah what does 2021 have in store that's the big question that's the big question. What does it have in store, Daniel? 
Um, not sure, Rich. Not sure. Hopefully, it will be a better year for everyone concerned, all the listeners. Um, any recommendations, chat to our listeners? Uh, maybe we'll put some things on um, Twitter for things to enjoy, entertain them. Obviously, apart from the podcast, during the festive season. I watched a good documentary last night called The Red Penguins about the Pittsburgh Penguins' ill-fated attempt to uh, make a splash in Russian ice hockey. That was very good. That was excellent, wasn't it? That's one of the Storyville films, isn't it? Um, yes. It's on the BBC iPlayer. I saw that the other day. Uh, yeah, I'd second that right. recommendation. Very enjoyable. Um, well, we will actually, over the festive period, we'll be posting on Twitter and Facebook uh, some of our favourite episodes from this year for people to dip in and out of if you're li- looking for something to listen to. There'll be stuff going on to the Friends of the Podcast feed, as I said over the Christmas period. And, well, if you haven't caught up with... Daniel, you mentioned Wackaday and whether Tadej Pogacar... I'm not sure they showed Wackaday in Slovenia. We'll have to check with our Slovenian friends. But uh, Well, he, Tim- was in, he was in the Vosge at the time. He was in Alsace at the time <laughs> on the morning of the, the penultimate <laughs> daytime trial in the tour. Anyway, go on. But would he have been watching... Uh, I'm not sure they were showing... You know, Wackaday finished about 25 years ago on TV. So, but the host, one of the hosts of Wackaday, Timmy Mallet, featured in the most recent episode of Explore. Uh, quite a, an eclectic crossover that, long distance cycling and uh, the host of Wackaday, famous of course for Mallet's Mallet. Uh, if you're wondering what on earth I'm talking about, just check out the uh, most recent episode of Explore, which is called Utterly which Brilliant. Which has had an extraordinary response. Uh, people seem to have really enjoyed hearing from Timmy Mallet. Uh, so yeah, it's the latest episode of Explore. Um, and I gather you were interrogated last week by Orla, Lionel, for the next uh, in, in introducing uh, one of us episodes. That in this case, you. That you've you yes, you've now put that into the public domain. Thank you, Richard. Yes, I've been uh, <laughs> I've been trying to <laughs> trying to wriggle out of that. Um, I, I think I made a comment uh, in the most recent Friends special where we discuss all of the best friends of the podcast <laughs> ideas. I said you you said <laughs> it was coming up soon, and and I I misunderstood what you meant and thought you were referring to um, the My First Tour series, which we created uh, in July when the Tour de France should have been on. And uh, you said, who's going to interview you for this? And I said, Orla, because she'll be a bit more sympathetic, perhaps. And uh, yeah, she was very, very, uh, it was uh, actually a more enjoyable experience than, uh, than I had. Than it would have been if it had been us interviewing you. You what, sorry? Than it would have been if it had been <laughs> us interviewing you. Well, no, I just, I just, um, yes. Yeah, you're right. That's absolutely right. <laughs> That's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, we're not putting that out right, at Christmas, well, are we? We're not going to we're not going to ruin people's Christmas by putting that out now. We'll we'll save that. For no, no, day. no, no. Like, and, and and not in January either. It's, uh, <laughs> le- leave it leave it until the spring and and leave, people leave start it until, feeling cheerful again. Yeah, leave it until the pandemic's over, eh? <laughs> <laughs> until we're all vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, on that note, there's one bonus episode coming next week for Amaraterra fans. Um, but that's it from us uh, for this year for, from a cycling point of view. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for listening. We really appreciate um, the messages that we've had um, from people who've obviously enjoyed uh, a bit of an escape from uh, reality at times this year. And uh, we've been pleased to be able to keep going. And uh, and we look forward to a, a more normal year next year. But thank you very much indeed for all your comments. And actually, um, just before we go, a little shout out for uh, a couple of people. Dominic Davenport, um, he's an orthopaedic surgeon. I think his wife was in touch recently uh, um, buying some books from us. But she said that he listens to the podcast each week and it's kept him going during a very hard year working throughout the COVID pandemic. Um, so, yeah, Dominic Davenport, an orthopaedic surgeon, thank you very much for listening and we appreciate uh, your support. Um, Marcus Banks, another orthopaedic surgeon as well, long-time correspondent. He also replaced my hip a few years ago. He's been in touch um, telling us about his um, his links with Larry Warbass and saying that he's very excited at the prospect of the casquette and tea towel combo arriving in the new year. So thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Dominic. And thank you, Daniel. Thank you, and Merry Christmas to all our listeners. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you, Rich, and Happy New Year to all of our listeners. We'll see you in 2021.